Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton, and in this video we are going to discuss an incredibly fascinating quality about mushrooms that perhaps you weren't aware of. But it is a quality that is surprisingly not uncommon within the fungal kingdom, and that quality is carnivory. This is a term we're familiar with when discussing many plant species that complement their photosynthetic energy with protein from captured insects. But many fungal species, potentially hundreds of them, do a similar thing. They supplement their diet with, or in some cases, they obtain all their nutrient needs from nematodes. Now this information isn't anything new. Researchers have been studying these nematophagous fungi since at least the mid-1800s. Though in recent decades, more and more papers have been published revealing the taxonomic diversity of these fungi, the sophistication of their methods of attack, and their potential uses as biocontrol agents in agricultural systems. Nematophagous fungi are all around me right now. They're probably all around you, and there's a good chance that you've eaten nematophagous fungi on many occasions. So if you have a few seconds to spare, allow me to take you on a journey involving these captivating mushrooms that paralyze, trap, colonize, digest, and destroy nematodes. To get started, we have to answer two questions first. What are nematodes and why would mushrooms go after them? So nematodes are roundworms with bodies that are long, narrow, and thread-like. And the ones that are relevant to our discussion today are microscopic in size, so you're unlikely to see them with your naked eye. And nematodes aren't rare, they're actually ubiquitous in all different kinds of habitats. They're found in forests, grasslands, in your yard, up in tree canopies, in desert ecosystems, in arctic ice, hot springs, and even in the ocean. Not all nematodes are considered to be pests. Many are beneficial, and they're involved in mutualistic relationships with a variety of organisms. Free-living nematodes perform essential roles in the decomposition process as they feed on bacteria, fungal tissue, fungal spores for sustenance, while the nematodes that are considered to be pests live within and parasitize plants and animals. And to date, they're reported to be about 30,000 species of nematodes worldwide, with over a million reported to exist on this planet. So a lot of undescribed nematode species. Now why would fungi feed on nematodes? Well the answer in one word is nitrogen. Living organisms like you and like mushrooms require nitrogen for the production of proteins, enzymes, nucleic acids, and other compounds that are essential for growth. The problem is that in many habitats where fungi grow, nitrogen in its usable form isn't always accessible, especially in dead wood and within forest soil. So nitrogen is often the limiting factor to growth of many fungal species. Now the thing about woody debris, including logs, sticks, stumps, wood chips, and standing snags, is that these substances are quite rich in carbohydrates. And therefore, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of wood is extremely high meaning there's a lot of carbon in wood compared to the amount of nitrogen. But remember, just like we require a proper balance of carbon to nitrogen in our bodies for healthy living, a proper balance of carbon to nitrogen is necessary for the optimal growth of other living things like fungi. So how do mushrooms and fungi solve this problem of acquiring usable nitrogen? Well, at least in the case of nematophagous fungi, many of which we'll discuss in a few seconds, they do so by supplementing their saprotrophic lifestyle, so their decomposer lifestyles, by also literally consuming nematodes, which are, remember, roundworms that are classified as members of the animal kingdom. And some nematophagous fungi rely exclusively on nematodes to meet all their nutrient needs. Now to be clear, the mushroom fruiting bodies themselves aren't the predators of nematodes. Instead, it's the fungal mycelia which is the thready, root-like vegetative network of fungi, which can be found in the soil or in a woody substrate, does all of the attacking and eating of nematodes. And there are many ways in which fungi, and more specifically their mycelia, prey upon these nitrogen-rich nematodes. Some fungi produce toxins that paralyze nematodes. Other fungi produce special attacking devices that pierce and cut nematodes. Many fungi physically trap nematodes using glue-like substances. 
other fungi, specifically target and kill nematode eggs. And these fungi are known as ovicidal fungi because they kill eggs. And some fungi spend almost their entire life cycles within the bodies of nematodes, acting as obligate parasites. Let's talk about the toxin-producing fungi first. These fungi produce powerful chemicals that stun and immobilize nematodes before penetrating into their bodies and digesting their internal contents. Now you're probably familiar with some of these toxin-producing nematophagous fungi, either because you've heard of them, you've seen them, or you've eaten them. For example, did you know that the common oyster mushroom is a toxin-producing nematophagous fungus? Many species in the Pleurotus genus, not just the common oyster mushroom, but many have been studied for their nematophagous abilities. Now, oyster mushrooms almost always grow on wood. And remember, wood as a substrate harbors very little usable nitrogen. So oyster mushrooms have to supplement their carbohydrate-rich diet with some usable form of nitrogen. To do this, oyster mushrooms eat nematodes. It's been shown in multiple studies that oyster mushrooms will produce droplets on their hyphae that contain toxins. And hyphae, if you're unfamiliar with the term, are branching filaments that make up, among other things, the mycelia of fungi. Once a nematode comes into contact with a toxic droplet, a cascade of bizarre and amazing things happen. The nematode first becomes paralyzed, its head region shrinks, and its esophagus becomes displaced. The fungus then colonizes and devours the defenseless nematode. The enoki mushroom, also known as the winter mushroom, velvet foot, velvet shank, enokitaki, flamulina volutipes, this edible mushroom has also been studied for its nematode killing capabilities. This is actually pretty brand new research on the nematode killing capabilities of enoki. And it seems to do this similar to the ways in which oyster mushrooms kill and digest nematodes. The thread-like filaments of mycelium, known as hyphae, from enoki mushrooms produce droplets that contain toxic enzymatic compounds, which when brought into contact with nematodes, will stun, immobilize, and destroy them. Another well-known fungus, this time one that's not necessarily commonly eaten, but one that's routinely encountered is the northern tooth fungus, Climacodon septentrionalis. This species attacks nematodes by producing droplets that stun and immobilize the nematodes. Another group of nematode-killing fungi include those that produce special attacking devices. Now these fungi are different in that they use mechanical methods to pierce the outermost layers of nematodes, causing their inner contents to leak out and ultimately allowing the fungus to gain entry into the nematodes before consuming them. And you're probably familiar with some of these producers of special attacking devices because you've either heard of them, you've seen them, or you've eaten them. For example, the shaggy mane mushroom, Coprinus comatus. This edible fungus produces what researchers call spiny balls, which are microscopic burr-like structures. And although these spiny balls are tiny, Lots of them, en masse, can mortally wound nematodes by cutting and piercing their outermost layers, causing the inner contents to leak out. Eventually, the fungi enter the nematode bodies and colonize them. Another fungus that you might be familiar with is the wine cap mushroom, Strophaeria rugoso annulata. Strands of Strophaeria mycelia produce large cells that contain spikes, and these specialized cells are known as acanthocytes. Similar to the spiny balls in shaggy mane mushrooms, the acanthocytes of Strophaeria mushrooms pierce the outer layers of nematodes, causing leakage of the internal contents. Eventually, the fungus will digest the nitrogen-rich contents. What else is interesting is that acanthocytes are not produced all over the mycelium of Strophaeria fungi, and nematodes that come into contact with the mycelial areas that lack acanthocytes are not harmed at all. Only when nematodes encounter acanthocytes are they susceptible to physical damage, paralysis, and death. The next group of nematode-killing fungi that we'll discuss include the nematode trappers. These fungi bind to and digest nematodes by first producing specialized traps which capture their prey. So instead of relying solely on toxins or on piercing devices, these fungi produce traps. The fungi will then penetrate, colonize, and digest the inner contents. Now these traps can either have an adhesive function that acts like glue, where the nematodes stick to the traps, 
or they can have non-adhesive functions but mechanical methods to capture their prey. One of the most widely used traps produced by fungi is known as the adhesive network. This contraption contains loops of fungal hyphae that ultimately become three-dimensional sticky networks with the sole purpose of capturing nematodes. Another trap produced by fungi involves an adhesive knob, which is a sticky globe-shaped cell on the fungal hyphae that captures nematodes. A third trap produced by fungi involves rings of fungal hyphae that catch nematodes through their adhesive capabilities. And yet another trap produced by fungi, one which may be the most specialized of all traps, is comprised of constricting rings that don't have sticky adhesive properties, but instead they swell around nematodes and essentially act as nooses that inflate and strangle the nematodes. Trap producing fungi also secrete compounds that assist in the capture of nematodes. And of course, as mentioned before, once the nematodes are trapped, the fungus then penetrates the nematode, colonizes them, and digests their nitrogen-rich contents. The next group of nematode killers that we'll discuss include the opportunistic slash egg killers. These fungi are similar to the nematode trappers in that they do capture nematodes through specialized trapping devices. However, this group, the opportunistic slash egg killers, specifically target nematode females, nematode eggs, and nematode cysts. And cysts are essentially containers of eggs that persist in the soil for several years. Now the mechanism here is relatively straightforward. These fungi form what are known as apressoria, which are specialized penetration pegs made of mycelia. These fungi colonize the egg surfaces of nematodes and penetrate the eggs or cysts through both mechanical and enzymatic actions. The fungi then digest the contents of the nitrogen-rich eggs. The fifth and final group that we'll discuss in this video include the endoparasites. And these fungi are different from the other nematophagous fungi for a few reasons, and that's why I decided to include this group last. The first reason is that these fungi don't really use hyphae as their initial and predominant method of attack. And number two, these fungi are almost entirely obligate parasites of nematodes, meaning these fungi, to a very large degree, are dependent on nematodes to complete their life cycles. Now these fungi can utilize their saprotrophic or decomposer lifestyles to a very, very small degree, but mostly they're spending their entire vegetative stages inside nematode bodies. Now, if these endoparasites do not initially infect nematodes through their hyphae, like most other nematophagous fungi do, how then do these endoparasites parasitize nematodes? Well, simply put, they do so through their spores. These spores have adhesive properties that allow the spores to cling to the outer layers of nematodes. Once the spores attach themselves to the nematodes, spore contents are injected into the nematodes. An internal mycelial network then develops and digests the inner contents of the nematodes then penetrates back to the outside of the dead nematodes to form fruiting structures that sporulate. Now, of course, researchers aren't just studying nematophagous fungi for kicks or for educational or informational purposes only. There's a growing demand, specifically within agricultural industries, to address the common concern of nematode pests that can inflict harm on plants and animals. So it's no surprise that nematophagous fungi are currently being studied for the biological control of plant parasitic nematodes. But in many of these cases, results aren't as promising as researchers would like, partly due to lack of extensive knowledge on the ecology of these organisms, and also the relative lack of field studies compared to laboratory studies. However, there seems to be some adequate preliminary research on the control of gastrointestinal parasitic infections involving nematodes in sheep and cattle. Studies have shown that by administering formulations involving nematophagous fungi, to sheep and cattle, disease symptoms within the animals are mitigated. Okay, so we covered a lot of information on these carnivorous fungi that prey upon nematodes. And carnivorous fungi is a term used by many researchers and mycologists, but perhaps a more accurate term might be omnivorous fungi because they do supplement their saprotrophic, carbohydrate-rich diets with nitrogen from nematodes. But in the case of endoparasites, these fungi almost rely exclusively on nematodes to meet their nutrient needs. 
But regardless, if the old adage is true, you are what you eat. And if you've eaten nematophagous fungi like oyster mushrooms and shaggy manes, then perhaps you've got some nematode inside of you. Thanks so much for watching this video. I truly appreciate it as always. If you enjoyed the video and you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, feel free to subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. You could head on over to learnyourland.com and sign up for the email newsletter. We could also stay in touch via social media at Learn Your Land on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks again. I'll see you on the next video.